Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me again. I know, by the way, that sometimes you, you get a notification that I'm going to start broadcasting in nine minutes, and sometimes twenty minutes <laughs> goes by. <laughs> I'll give you. A, I'll give you a hint. I'll get a little inside scoop. When that happens, it's almost always because some uh, I am experiencing some technical snafu. Um, and then other times it says I'm going to start broadcasting in 10 minutes like this this broadcast <laughs> and I start broadcasting in 90 seconds, 60 seconds and that's just because sometimes I don't have time to wait <laughs> for for the 9 minutes to go by so anyway, sorry about that thank you for your patience and understanding <laughs> So this is my third phase, if you will, of, on this painting, depending how you count them. And I'm wanting largely to, to uh, at the moment, I'm doing, as you can see, glaze, transparent glazes, and I'm using here's a little bowl with a transparent medium in it with with acrylics, if you um, if you use too much water to, to thin down the paint, um, the the paint the, the the wetness of it will cause the, the 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 color just to run off your canvas. So you put it on and it looks great for a minute while you put it on. Then you look back five minutes later, and say, "Wait a minute, what happened to that you know red that I just put on there? Seems like it all disappeared." So. Uh, to keep that from happening, you have to use a transparent medium instead. Can't use too much water. So you have to use a trans. And especially, also, if you if you want the, the the glaze, which is what I'm doing now, if you want the glaze to be particularly really transparent, glass-like transparent, then you must um, use a transparent glaze instead of water. Again, so. I use quite a bit of water on my brushes. That is to say, my brushes are quite damp. Uh, but, oh, I'm gonna use here, I'm gonna bust open the brown for the first time in this painting. But let's see, not pure brown. Yeah, brown plus orange. I'm gonna uh, vignette the corners a little bit vignetting <laughs> because I'm turning the word the noun vignette into a into a verb I'm not actually sure it is I should look that up sometime Oxford dictionary whatever find out is to vignette <laughs> you know, is that a verb everybody knows a vignette is you know, darkening the corners but to to do a vignette to, to vignette is that, is that a verb I don't know but I use it as a verb quite often anyway um, a, a vignette is is often a good idea. I always wait. Get a little static. Hang on. There we go. Sorry about that. Glad I heard it though. Um, it, it is a, often a good idea. I I, 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 hate, I caution to say that it's always a good idea. Of course, nothing is always a good idea. But anyway. Right, I think, yeah, the next thing I'm going to do, so I called this, um, this painting session, the last three stages. Let's see if I'm right. First stage was glaze, done. S second, gla second stage of this phase, second step, is going to be drawing with brushes, transparent colors, fine detail, relatively fine detail and then white highlights. Now there's, it's possible I might do pencil in between, in which case there'd be four. Did you like, did you like that? <laughs> Just to make sure you really get the full impact. 
<laughs> four layers. <laughs> um, all right. Hey, this would be a good time to talk about. Hello, Seldom MM. Thank you very much. You're very kind for saying Simply Amazing. Very sweet. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to draw with a, a color. And of course, hey, for those of you who are new, just all of these colors are pre-mixed. Well, not mixed. They're straight out of the tube colors, but they're pre-mixed with a transparent medium. So these are all transparent, except for white, of course, which is opaque. These, so it's all transparent colors. So um, I'm actually mixing a couple of those together right now to get a dark bluish green. There's, there's a lot of green in this setting, in this scene. It's a wedding painting. Uh, I did, I did a live painting at the wedding about a month ago. And uh, the client, in this case, first time ever, I think, has ordered two paintings of the same size. I often get, you know, in order to do a smaller, I get in order to do a smaller painting after the event. But I don't think I've ever had one like this where the client was asking me to do two paintings, essentially exactly the same. Now that does indeed present me with quite a challenge because I don't know what my personality, skill set, gifting, whatever you want to call it, I don't know what it is, but one of the characteristics of my personality is I hate doing the same thing twice. So this is, this is quite a challenge. They're paying me real money <laughs> to do it, so you know, you'll do a lot of things for money. <laughs> but so it is definitely an art definitely an artistic challenge that's a point I'm trying to make definitely an artistic challenge to do the same scene twice and um, I am actually not I do have the first painting that I did over there to my left um, I'm not looking at it much I don't want to be influenced by it too much um, so these paintings, this will be an interesting study, actually. It'll be interesting to see, to me, it'll be interesting to see how uh, two versions of the same scene come out different. That, that I, it's not my job to make it happen. I, I just know it's going to happen because, as you can see, I have a, a painting process that I'm following. And I'm following the process. I'm, I'm quite convinced that's the best solution to this artistic challenge for me, is just to paint essentially the way I always do. So not, not try to contort myself in any way. I think if I do that, I, I very likely could end up with a bad painting. But if I just follow the normal process, I'll probably be okay. <laughs> And the, my client, it, one, one of the paintings is for, I said earlier, one of the paintings is evidently for the bride and the other is for the bride's mother. And uh, I, I, I certainly hope, I certainly hope, number one, that I don't cause a family fight. And even more so, because it is kind of dangerous, I hope that they don't come back to me and say, well, you know, we don't like this painting as much as the other one. Can you change it? And whoa, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Whew. Such a thing is certainly conceivable. I'm just hoping and praying that that does not happen. I'm going to try to do two blockbuster paintings so that they will have a hard time, each of them picking which one they like better. Whew. I hope that's the case. So it is a little bit dangerous. And certainly don't recommend this kind of thing. One of my primary goals with this particular layer right here, that is dark transparent details. One of my prim primary goals is to get um, the, the dark values, the dark areas of the painting. Not quite all the way as dark as they need to be, but close, approaching. Again, 
when I the, when I'm finished the acrylic phase, I expect the the painting the I expect these. I've already said this today. I'll say it again. Here's what I expect. I expect the um, the drawing to be pretty close, pretty darn close to to accurate and perfect and realistic. Okay. And uh, it doesn't have to be in great detail, but it has to be close. That's the that's the hope. I can make changes in the oil phase, oil stage, but I don't like to. I don't like to have to make corrections. I just, I'd rather just be making refinements in the oil stage. All right, so I want the drawing accurate. I want the, uh, the values, which is a big part of what I'm working on right now, besides drawing right now. I'm working on, I want the values to be close. That is the lightness, darkness, okay, to be close. And third, I, I want the colors to be close. So those are my three things I'm aiming for. When I, when I accomplish those, then, I, then I'm free to proceed to oils. Okay, all of my paintings, virtually all of my paintings, follow this pattern. They are acrylic underneath and oil on top. Rare exceptions. There are exceptions, but they're pretty rare. And I haven't said anything today about painting with two hands. And some of you newcomers are saying, wow, this guy paints with two hands. Yeah, get over it. You'll get, <laughs> you'll get used to it. <laughs> it happens a lot. I will, I will talk periodically about why, how I started painting with two hands and why. I don't want to get into it right now. So I'll just save that for another time. Um, it certainly does speed things up, by the way. That is one advantage of painting with two hands. It's not the biggest advantage, but it's one of them. When I'm painting live at an event, I'm going, going 100 miles an hour with two hands. Every once in a while, the thought crosses my mind. You know what? I couldn't do this. That is painting 100 miles an hour if I wasn't using two hands. But anyway, that's another, for another time, I feel like. I don't want to get into it right now. Um... I'm saving all the drawing on the on the bride and groom here uh, for just a few minutes from now. I haven't even started them yet. Once again, when I'm when I'm finished with this phase right here, I I will decide whether to uh, do pencil, and, and that is determined mostly by how much pencil is still visible at at the end of my at the end of the stage all right i think i'm ready to proceed with the bride and groom to that end i'm going to pull up a photograph of them Let me just tape it right there i will I don't know what I'll do for the, my edit because I'm trying to, the reason I'm wearing a tux, this, I don't usually, <laughs> I wear a tux when I'm painting live at the event, but I don't wear a tux when I'm painting in my studio usually. But I'm thinking that I'm, I might uh, edit this video because uh, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever done a full-size live, uh, no, what's what I'm looking for, a painting as if it were live. Um, in my studio. So it's a rare opportunity for me to uh, create a video that is a little more controlled and edited and so forth. I'll clean it up and take out all the all this talking, of course. Again, I want this this drawing and the drawing of the bride and groom to be close. Not it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be has to be fairly close. I don't want to I don't want to find myself requiring huge amounts of redrawing in the oil stage. Little bits of redrawing is fine. And of course, if you're familiar with my wedding paintings, and you know that their faces are going to end, are going to end up pretty much you know photorealistic or portrait realistic would be a better term it's 
squinting and looking. Oh, one topic I've thought about mentioning several times in this painting today, and I haven't yet. Let's do it right now. It's what I call the dance of painting. It's a good way to, it gives, it can give you a process for your painting. If you want to know if you're painting long and then all of a sudden you say to yourself, huh, what do I do now? I have, I have one way to answer that question. It's many ways to answer it, but one way is what I call the dance of painting, which of course requires considerable explanation. So let me, let me give it to you. First of all, it's based on the assumption that you paint like I do, layer, 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 layer. So my, my propensity for painting in layers is not by any means rare or unusual, especially if you go back centuries to the, the classic era, Rembrandt and company, Rubens and Vermeer and so on and so forth. If you go back to the, all the great painters, essentially, I'm going to overstate the case to, just to make the case, essentially all the great painters before 1890 uh, painted in layers, or sometimes I call them phases, phase one, two, three, four, five, etc., etc. layers, layer upon layer. Um, so number one, let's assume you're going to paint in layers as opposed to kind of like all at once, like you paint the, like you paint here, here's all at once painting. You paint the sky, the clouds, you're done. You paint the mountains, you're done. You paint the hills, you're done. You paint the trees in front of the hills, you're done. You paint the barn in front of the tree, are you with me? You're done. You paint the horse in front of the barn and you're done. That is a very... I would say archaic. It's very intuitive, and and people who are um, still working through their their the first half, I call it, of their painting journey, that is the way many of them paint. It's very um, like intuitive in the sense of like, yeah, what else would you do? <laughs> and I certainly painted that way years ago for many years. Um, so, but as opposed to that, if I'm painting the same, that, the scene I just, imaginary scene I just described that has sky, mountain, hills, trees, barn, horse, fence, weed, um, I paint like a watercolor painter. In that, I have all of those, all of those elements f firmly in mind and firmly in process from the get-go. Uh, in other words, here's a table here. I don't know if you can see that there's a table with a cake on it. I didn't paint into the wall, the fireplace, the window, the bush, the plant, and then paint the table in front of it, you see? The, the, the capturing, the rendering of the table happens concurrent with the rendering of the fireplace itself. So, so, because I paint, like a watercolor is a good analogy, like a watercolor painter, I paint everything uh, in layers. All right, so that, that's the, the prerequisite for everything I'm going to say next. Now I'm going to describe the dance of painting. This is a, the, it's an analogy. The kind of dance I'm talking about might, might be the kind of dance you would see in a Broadway play or in a, <laughs> going back in an old 40s movie, a, a, a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, that kind of dance. I don't mean, I'm not talking mosh pit. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a choreographed dance, all right? That kind, a ballet dance. Not a belly dance, <laughs> a ballet dance. <laughs> and in a good dance, in a good choreo choreographed dance, there are large movements and small movements. <laughs> That's my, I have to stop there because now I'm going to talk about in painting. There are light marks and dark marks, or light steps and dark steps. 
large steps and small steps. Realistic or literal, I'll use the word, you'll see why in a minute, literal marks and abstract marks. So let me give you those. There's three couplets and the, the first letter of each begins with letter L. Large and small, light and dark, literal and abstract. Three cup, three sets. What, what that means is you're painting in layer, 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 layer. If your last step was large and dark, then your next step should be possibly you should be you should lean toward light and small. If your last if your last step in your painting process, your last layer was very literal, then it's very likely that your next step should be very abstract. And you see me doing that the whole time. I'll do some careful drawing and then I'll come back with abstract glazes, big, big brush stuff. So little steps, small brushes, big steps, big brushes. You'll see me do dark stuff than light stuff. All right, right at the moment, I'm going to do a light step. And for the first time on this particular painting, I'm going to use some opaque color. So I'm, I'm breaking my rule a bit because the rule in my world of painting is essentially that all the colors are transparent. Right now, all the colors on this canvas are, are in fact transparent, but I'm about to break that rule because I'm gonna work on their flesh tone. And uh, instead of putting down white and then, and then doing a glaze on top of it, I'm gonna mix up a, a, an opaque orange because that's close to their flesh tone color. And let's put this photograph back up here. Let's make that a little darker. All right, so the, the dance, as you're, it's a process, it's a word picture to help you with process. If the last thing you did was very literal, like right now, the marks I'm making right now are small or little, <laughs> to use the letter L again, small, light, right? I'm not putting dark marks on the canvas. I'm putting light marks, small, light, and literal. That means that it's, if I follow the concept of the dance of painting, that would mean the next step in my painting process is likely to be large, dark, and abstract. Of course, and that's really easy in my world. That simply means glazes. That's exactly what I'm going to do as soon as I get the oil. All right, so let me give you those three couplets again. You want your painting process, your painting layers to be characterized by large marks followed by small ones. Light marks followed by dark ones and vice versa, right? And literal marks versus abstract or expressive. I don't like usually to word, use the word expressive because people get confused. They think I'm talking about the artist expressing him or herself. Do you know the expression, expressive salute? The expressionist salute, you know it, don't you? Back of palm to forehead <laughs> and, and mouth agape and eyes aloft. I'm hoping that was I'm hoping that wasn't on camera, but I think it was. No, I'm kidding. All right, just in case you want to know, if you want to be an abstract expressionist, okay, I'm good. If you want to be an abstract expressionist painter? Here's all you have to do. <laughs> right? I mock. I do indeed. Uh, abstract expressionist painting, in my opinion, deserve to be mocked vociferously. So there you go. <laughs> If you can't draw, if you can't paint, can't draw or paint, but you want to be an artist, you become an abstract expressionist. End of story. <laughs> and if I made you mad, well, it's about time. Somebody, it's about time somebody made you mad. All right, I think <laughs> in, this, in this respect, I'm uh, going, 
don't usually do this. I'm going to do a little bit of a opaque uh, blue on Tuan, the man's name here, the groom's name. He's uh, Vietnamese, I believe, and his name is T-O-A-N, Tuan. Oops, that's a little bit too light. Hang on, let's try to back that down a little bit. I don't want these, I do not want these blue marks to be too precise. Um, I've experienced that many times before, painting the groom's black tux, or in this case, dark blue suit, um, with a hard outline. It always looks as though the groom has been pasted into the painting. That's a real challenge. All right, I think that's close enough. So I indeed, indeed, I am up to the last phase, unless I decide to do pencil. Nope, not yet. We're okay. We're okay without any pencil at the moment. Um, <laughs> hello, Redina. That's right. Large, small, large, light, dark, detail, abstract. Correct. Very good. Um, let me clean up my little palette here again because I don't want these opaque colors on my palette. I don't want them to dry there. So, All right, opaque white. Now, so I'm, now I'm playing by my rules. Now I'm following my my uh, my formula uh, accurately, which is almost all of the. Uh, light stuff in the in the acrylic stages is um, opaque white then then there'll be glazes of course several glazes on top of what I'm doing right here I think uh, my students when I'm when I'm teaching this technique um, that is one of the challenges that my students have. Um, often they have a hard time seeing slapping down white like this because it's 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 way too light. Of course, it's it's it is way too light, but not to worry because we're going to put. Um, colored glazes on it soon enough. Essentially, as soon as we um, as soon as we uh, graduate to oils, we, we will be putting glazes on top of this white. Now, it's, it's also possible that, when, that I may not be done with the with the uh, acrylic stage. I may, f I may finish with this white and go, ah, it's too white, I'm gonna, I'm gonna glaze it in, in acrylic. And if I do glaze it in acrylic, then I'll come back one more time with white. I say this pretty much every time you watch me doing a wedding painting, I, I get on the subject of the elongation of figures. I do indeed. I elongate uh, all of my figures, uh, at wedding or otherwise, um, because people are we all are conditioned to seeing idealized figures, not not realistic figures. Realistically, most human beings are seven heads tall, but you know, people, uh, women who are model esque, who are tall and thin, are typically considerably more than seven heads tall, men even more so. And uh, when I'm painting a portrait, I, I want to exaggerate, I want to elongate the, the couple enough so that they look good to themselves. Not so much that they 
that they're with their first glance they go wait a minute he made me skinny that that is not my goal i don't want i wouldn't want their first glance to say skinny or thin i would want their first glance to say "Ooh, i look good get it so it's a real delicate with all brides and with all portraits with all full length or figure portraits it's always a delicate balance um trying to capture just the right amount of exaggeration, if you will. Again, my goal is that they wouldn't see the exaggeration first. They might see it second or third glance, like, wait a minute, he made us um, thinner, taller, whatever, whichever is taller and thinner are, I mean, thinner and taller are the same thing, right? <laughs> same, the same essence. I've never, I've never had a complaint yet. Uh, it could happen anytime. I've never had a complaint from a client say, you made us too thin. Um, I did have a complaint one time when a, a the mother of the bride at midnight came and said, I complained and that was my mistake. I made it years ago. I learned a hard lesson from it. Um, indeed. And that was back in this was back in the day when I, my wedding portraits were quite a bit more abstract than they are not the not they I wasn't doing this realistic stuff like I'm doing now and one of the mistakes I made was allowing the the figure the bride to be more abstract but accidentally you know I gave her more pronounced cheekbones in other words I made her a little bit more average, common, typical, model-esque. Um, and indeed, the, the bride's mother came, it was not a, not a happy moment. But thankfully, I put on my big boy pants, so to speak, and said, okay, here we go. And I worked very hard from midnight until 12.40. And uh, she was quite happy with the result you know, 45 minutes later. That was one of those Long Island, New York, Long Island, uh, either Jewish or Italian weddings. I don't remember which. And the only reason I mention that is because in my experience, those, those are the, the most, uh, what's the word, expensive, um, most over the top, the most uh, extreme, <laughs> anyway. Uh, receptions seem to be in those two communities and and they go quite late now I'm I'm the only worker bee there who's glad it's going late worker bee like you know food service and all that kind of stuff because uh, the later it goes the more the closer to finished I can I can the, the more finish I can achieve in my portrait anyway <laughs> I hope I'm not getting myself in trouble here So I don't mind a, a reception going till one o'clock or one thirty, and they do, especially in those communities, it, it, New York, for one thing, and it seems to be Italian and Jewish. I'm once again, I'm very aware of values I'm, of course I'm painting with white so what else what what else could I be right um, I'm, I'm very conscious focused on the the flow of the the white areas it's not a mistake that this the light uh, this is a tablecloth here it's not a mistake that that connects to the top of the hearth a light there and that that connects to the dress and that the that there's a light glow up here. Anyway, all those things are very intentional um, and not at all haphazard. Um, I've, I've been looking at some paintings lately, I think probably like in restaurants or things like that. And um, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my teacher hat, turn on my teacher voice for just a minute in case there's anybody listening who who is a an aspiring artist. If you are, listen to me. I'm here to change your life and make you a better painter, okay? The big, in my opinion, the big hurdle. What's the difference? I'm gonna sound slightly, forgive me, slightly arrogant, so just put on put on your seatbelt. I'm, I'm not arrogant, but I can't say this. What is the difference between pretty good painter I'm trying to sort of your run-of-the-mill big city local painter person who has paintings hanging in restaurants and the next level up artistically I don't, I'm not talking about marketing a lot of it has to do with marketing and at which I am not particularly great but what's the difference I'm gonna tell you the difference between the the so-so mediocre also rands you know that expression, the also rands in the art world. And uh, now, obviously, by saying this, I'm insinuating that I'm in the latter category. And I'm sorry, that's where some of you might say, man, he's so arrogant. But I can't teach without making some statement. So um, here it is. And now, somebody, somebody like Richard Schmidt might say, well, same to you, buddy. You think you're all that, but you're not as good as me. And here's why. And, how much money would I be willing to give for Richard Schmidt to tell me that? And the answer is quite a lot. But I, anyway, never mind. Let's, let's get on to the topic. What's the difference? Here it is. The mid-range, I'm trying not to use the word mediocre, <laughs> but you can, you can kind of hear it in my stuttering, stuttering, stop, stammering <laughs> speech. What's the difference between mediocre painter and next level up? Here it is. The mediocre painter is painting pictures. And I always mispronounce that word on purpose. For you, for those of you who are English as a second language, let me explain. The, the, real, the pron correct pronunciation of that word is picture, P-I-C, picture, T-U-R-E, picture, picture. And I'm saying intentionally, I'm saying pitcher like a pitcher of water. I don't know why I do that. It's because I'm ornery. <laughs> I'm mispronouncing the word so that you will get the, the subliminal message that it's not good to paint pictures. It is not good. So the mediocre, middle of the road, not quite eminently successful painter, they paint pictures. They paint, you name it. They paint a picture of the mountain. They paint a picture of the barn. They paint a picture of a rose. They paint a picture of a horse. They paint a picture, 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 picture of you name it. A light out here in North Carolina, they paint a picture. I'm still mispronouncing the word on purpose, which suggests to you that this is not a good thing. They paint a picture. That is not our job. As good artists, we don't paint pictures. We paint paintings. The most important thing on this canvas is paint. The physical, tactile, literal paint. It's not bride and groom, fireplace, table, cake. Do you understand? It's not the picture, even though, as you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm a pretty realistic painter. But I know, I know which side is the right side to come down on. And it's not on the side of painting a picture. It's the coming down on the side of painting a painting, which means line, shape, color, composition, value, texture, all of those things are paramount. That means more important, more, more critical, more important than bride, groom, bench, plant, window, you got it, candelabra, fireplace, flowers, blah, blah, blah. All the stuff that's in the picture. All the stuff that's in the picture, while I'm talking about it, it might be helpful to put up my finished painting of this, of this wedding. So, so there we go. There's, and I'll zoom in for a minute so you can see. So there's how 
realistic my bride and groom are. Bear with me just a minute. Get yep, real close. Hang on, hang on. There you. Go. So that's a picture, right there. That's a picture of the bride and groom, and it's pretty good. It's darn accurate. You have to take my word for it right now. But that's not what makes this a good painting. If it is a good painting, I mean, what makes it a good painting is color, composition, texture, line, values. In other words, all the abstract elements is what makes it a good picture. What makes it a good painting, I'm sorry, is what does this pinkish stuff look like next to this dark, dirty, greenish stuff? Do you see what I mean? It's absolutely molecular or, uh, abstract elements. The abstract elements qua as abstract elements. What does this um, aqua color, how does that feel next to this orange and vice versa? And, and I don't mean that you have to answer that in your, with your conscious, and I don't expect a non-artist to understand any of this when they look at the painting. There's just something about it. Either it surprises them or it doesn't, or it appeals to them or it doesn't. And it's my job to make sure it does appeal to them. And they won't say, oh, look at what I like is how that aqua looks next to that orange. No, they, they, they won't know. They don't have the vocabulary, and they're not supposed to. And of course, here's a, you know, a dead ringer. If I say so myself, dead ringer, accurate portrait of the bride and groom. That part is picture. You understand? Again, mispronouncing the word on purpose. But you can tell these are flowers. You can tell this is a fireplace. You can tell these are candles. You can tell it's a wedding cake, blah, blah. You can tell these are windows. But more than windows, when you get up close, they're like, huh, that's interesting. It's just a mess. It's just a smorgasbord of colors and textures. That's good painting. That, again, it sounds like I'm bragging. I'm not, but that's the best I can do to describe, to explain the difference between, and there is for some of you, for some of you painters, artists, there might be benefit in what I just said. You gotta get past painting pictures. Now, the first half of our art journey, I say all the time, by the way, I, yeah, I'm done here. So I'm gonna, while I talk, I'm gonna, put away my put away my paints um, we most of us I believe the ideal art journey is in fact to spend the first half these halves are not equal we spend the first half of our art journey learning how to paint pictures I, I affirm that emphatically learn doggone it learn how to draw even if you have to cheat so to speak, even if, you use, even if you have to use photomechanical technical tricks, which I do to get my, to get my portraits accurate. That's a long story. I won't get into it again now. I'll come back to it, no doubt, many times. Um, learn how to draw. I believe that's step number one. See, for a for hundred years, the art professors in the prevailing progressive art world had said, no, 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 no. Don't learn how to draw. That's a detriment. Instead, learn how to express yourself which i vehemently disagree with by the way all the people almost except for the one in a million that hit it big almost all the people that take that approach are starving artists most of my professors could not make it they could not do what i've done which is pay their mortgage for 40 years based on their art skills because they didn't have enough art skill. That's why they were professors. Whew, that's mean. It's true, but it's mean. But it's still mean, but it's still true. Anyway. Um, anyway, and that sounded arrogant too. Forgive me, I'm gonna, st <laughs> I'm gonna stop this broadcast before I say anything else that sounds horribly arrogant. Let me see what kind of wonderful comments you guys are making. <laughs> if David's here, he's rebuking me for sounding arrogant. <laughs> Um. <laughs> Radina, love you, girl. Way out there in Vancouver. 
I mean, near Vancouver, on Vancouver Island, right? Oh, why am I dressed? Yes, yes, because I'm making a video and I want it to look like I'm painting at a wedding so that when I edit this video, it will look, sorry, scratch my nose, look like I'm actually painting at a wedding. <laughs> And Redina, how's he adjusting the mood going out on the street? It is, it, thank you for asking. Um, it, it has been an interesting journey. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm enjoying my new life, my new career. No question about that. But it does come with some emotional <laughs> checks. I haven't been painting as much. That's pretty obvious. I haven't been broadcasting as much. And I, I miss that. But I don't miss it enough to, to wish I could go back. Now, you know, using my language, if you'll allow, if the Lord told, tells me to go back next week to being a full-time artist, bam, I'm on it. I'll do it. Uh, but at the moment, I think I'm doing the right thing. And I'm a pretty serious musician, and my music has taken a definite back seat for the last 16 years. And I'm serious enough of a musician that that's always grieved me a little bit. So now, kind of the shoes on the other foot. Now I'm a full-time, now I'm a lot more serious musician. And uh, now my art is taking a back seat, which bothers me, but you can't do everything. So there you go. Thanks, Redina. That's a good question. I, I am enjoying it. There are definitely emotional adjustments, as you've suggested. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Hello, right? And Wright's asking, what's with the tux? I just answered that again, I think. It's because I rarely, I don't know if I've ever done a full-size uh, after-wedding painting uh, that's in the style of, the same style I do when I'm live at a wedding. So I realized that this would be a good opportunity. I'm going to edit the heck out of this video and and do, you know, time-lapse and all kinds of things so that I can post a another uh painting process on my in my marketing on my website instagram and so on and so forth all right that's why i'm dressed up by the way it's a clip-on tie and i never wear clip-on ties to uh weddings anymore <laughs> i'm such a snob no no honestly it was about 10 or 12 years ago I, no no not quite it was about nine years ago i'd been doing wedding paintings for two or three years and all of a sudden like i started i kept on getting into like fancier and more expensive hoity-toity weddings you know and about the first time i went to manhattan to do a wedding i went um you know what i think only kids from michigan use clip-on bow ties <laughs> that's where i grew up <laughs> and i went what am i thinking i wouldn't be caught dead with a you know clip-on string long tie anyway <laughs> but this is a clip-on because it's just for look just for show just for video. anyway I digress. So what else is new? <laughs> Digression is my middle name. Daniel Digression Nelson, just in case you ever wondered. All right, thanks. Um, I won't be painting tomorrow or Friday. Uh, Nancy and I are actually in with some friends. Nancy's my wife. We're, <laughs> we're driving up to Philadelphia, where I'm going to play my musical instruments on the streets, Lord willing, of Philadelphia. Um, I'm, I'm concocting a new term. It's, it's called play pray pray play i i uh, believe i have uh, spiritual authority to play my musical instrument so i go up to, to and people like my playing i mean i play pretty stuff i'm there to shift the atmosphere so i'll be tied up the next two days whether i don't know whether i'll next time i'll it would be saturday would be next po 